Hi there. Thanks for joining me on Rethink Real Estate for Good. I'm Eve Picker, and I'm on a mission to make real estate work for everyone. I love real estate. Real estate makes places good or bad, rich or poor, beautiful or not. In this show, I'm interviewing the disruptors, those creative thinkers and doers that are shrugging off the status quo in order to build better for everyone. And speaking of building better, I'm very excited to share that my company, Small Change, is now raising capital through a community round that is open to the public. Small Change is a leading equity crowdfunding platform for impact investment in real estate. For as little as $250, anyone 18 and over can invest in Small Change, helping to fuel our growth as we disrupt the old boys club of capital that routinely ignores so many qualified people and projects. Please visit wefunder.com forward slash small change to review the full details of our raise and to make an investment if you can. And remember, investing is risky. Don't invest more than you can afford to lose. Today, I'm talking with Jameson Manwaring for a second time. Jameson is enjoying success as the co-founder and CEO of Neighborhood Ventures, an Arizona-based real estate crowdfunding company focused on value-add multifamily properties. Always interested in finance, Jameson went to business school and studied finance. He loved it enough to become president of the finance club. Even at a young age, Jameson's determination shone through. He wanted to work in New York at a top finance firm, but those companies have their pick of Ivy League school graduates, which he was not. So every Thursday night, he flew the red eye to New York to network. But wait, if I tell you what happened next, I'd be a spoiler. So listen in to hear the rest of the story. If you'd like to join me in my quest to rethink real estate, there are two simple things you can do. Share this podcast or head over to RethinkRealEstateForGood.co and subscribe. You'll be the first to hear about my podcasts, blog posts and other goodies. Hi, Jameson. It's it's great to have you back on my show. Hey, Eve. Good to be back. Um... As I was mentioning in the intro, I'd much rather be in uh, Pittsburgh right now. You're 80 degrees. We're supposed to hit 99 degrees, and it's still mid-September. So <laughs> we're, we're ready for the cooler weather here in, in Phoenix. Yeah. The real estate is hot as well. So As hot <laughs> as the weather. <laughs> That's right. So I want to go back to your background, which is solidly in finance, all, all the way back to college when you majored in finance. Um, and I'm wondering what led you to launch Neighborhood Ventures and focus on real estate. I didn't know what I was going to study when I got to college, not unlike many people. And I uh, started in accounting, did some accounting classes, ended up landing with finance um, because what I knew I wanted to learn was how to analyze a business. And I kind of look at finance as the language of business. You know, if you if you are a good entrepreneur and you can start a business, at some point you're going to need to understand what's happening in the business. And I had I had actually started a small business right out of, of high school uh, that was like a for sale by owner service. At one point, we had a couple hundred listings, oh, and we wow. would charge people a, a flat fee, like a thousand dollar fee, to list their home, and would market it for them and. The business was great at times, and then at times it wasn't great. And I really didn't understand why, what was driving that, what was beneath the the uh, results. So ended up knowing that I wanted to go to college to be able to learn how to analyze a business and ended up in finance, which is where, you know, trying to understand a business for um, either investment purposes, if you're from the looking at the company kind of outside in, or if you're inside the company, learning how to manage the business properly, where, where to spend money, where to pull back 
uh, capital, where to reinvest more capital. And so that was a very useful uh, skill that I'm, I'm really happy I ended up sticking with that major. That's where you started with finance. So take me on the journey from there to neighborhood ventures. Out of uh, college, well, my junior year of college, I decided I wanted to go to Wall Street. And I don't know if I'd seen a movie. I'm trying to, to, to think back at the time. It was after the great financial crisis. So some of those movies were out. The, the big short was out. And I was definitely intrigued by everything that was done by the investment banks, the uh, importance of that in our economy, uh, the importance of the work they do. And so I determined that I wanted to go get to Wall Street. And I was from University of Utah, which is not a school that the investment banks recruit not at. Ivy, they don't not, really consider. Not Ivy no. League, right? No. Yeah, they, they really focus on, on uh, those Ivy League schools. So I had to go in what I call the side door. <laughs> and I started uh, flying out on a Thursday night red eye after class. Didn't have class on Friday. I'd fly out to New York. Thursday night red eye uh, would arrive at about 6.30 a.m. in JFK, uh, jet blue flight. And, uh, and I would start uh, reaching out to, to folks. I would try to have a few meetings set up in advance, just an info session. So I would, ask, I would tell folks, hey, if I can have 15 minutes of your time, I'm just trying to, I'm a college student, which kind of opens, opens people's doors. Yeah. Opens yeah. doors. And uh, these were alumni from either University of Utah or BYU, which is, there's a lot of close ties there. And I'm here in New York for the day. I would love to be able to come by and meet. What I also found is Friday afternoons, a lot of people on Wall Street, it's a little bit of downtime. They kind of have to be in the office, but they don't mind having spending some time with somebody to get off of their desk. And so uh, I, I did that for a couple of months. I probably did a half That's a dozen exhausting. trips. That's <laughs> exhausting. It was. And uh, I spent the night in a, in a, a, at the beginning in a hostel with eight other people. And that was a new experience for me. I, I was like, I got to get out of here as soon as possible. <laughs> at least it wasn't it a was, park bench, right? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was close. It was about, I think it was 25 bucks a night. Um, and then even the cheapest hotel was like 125, which I couldn't afford. So um, I ended up uh, meeting a lot of great people who even to this day are I'm connected with and, and view them as mentors through that process. I it was kind of one of my experiences that was really hard. But, you know, you look back and you're like, I'm very glad I did that. And I don't know if I could do it again. <laughs> right. oh, it's pretty gutsy. I don't know how many people would take that on. You know, that's. Uh... <laughs> well, and being from Utah, the people who know say you have to do it that way if you want to get there. So interesting. You got to go um, hustle. I ended up meeting an alumni who I didn't ask him for an internship, but we connected a few times and he said, Hey, would you be interested in doing an internship with us? He was at Barclays Capital, which uh, had bought Lehman Brothers. He was a senior person there. And I said, uh, yeah, I'd love an internship. And now that you ask, I would love one. Right? <laughs> uh, and um, he got me an interview, phone interview. And then when I passed that, they flew me out and uh, did a super day. I didn't know what would happen. I didn't have any other options for that, that internship, but they ended up giving me an offer. And uh, I, I think they paid, they paid pretty decent enough that I could move to there for the summer, uh, live not in New have York. To, pay, not have to stay apartment. in the hostel, right? <laughs> not have to stay in a hostel, which was very exciting. And I, I worked on a sales and trading floor there, uh, do, selling um, equities and talking about equities that um, basically what we did was we would promote the research of the firm. Hey, this is a stock that we like. This is stock we don't like. Talk to clients about their thoughts on it. And it was a great experience. Um, I ended up moving from the sales floor to the actual research floor, which I'm very happy I did. That's where you can really do deep dive uh, financial analysis on companies. And I worked on a few IPOs and uh, ended up moving to Goldman Sachs uh, in their technology team and uh, working with software stocks. That's pretty impressive. From Utah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and it's uh, um, kind of back to your, your question. 
one of the things that I learned through this time was I loved investing, but I didn't like equities, in particular tech equities. They're very volatile. They, they have big swings, daily swings sometimes, especially software stocks up uh, 15, 20% after earnings, down 15, 20% after earnings if they miss. And it did not suit me when it came to my kind of temperament. temperament. Yeah. Yep. I get that. It doesn't suit me either. <laughs> Maybe it's a control thing. You kind of got to understand what's making those swings happen, right? And it's pretty hard to yeah. get that. And there's a lot of factors in public equities that are outside of our knowledge and our control. There's a lot of quant funds that are just trading on the on the algorithm and it, they don't make sense, but they move the market. I was certainly turned off by any impact I could have, <laughs> right? You're just one person in such a large pool of people. So I learned a lot there, but I began looking for my next option and um, knew that I wouldn't be there forever. One of the companies I worked on their IPO was LifeLock. They're based in uh, Tempe, Arizona and had grown a business to several million subscribers around identity protection. I worked on their IPO and I got to know the CEO and the CFO. And through that process, I kind of let them know, hey, if anything comes up, I would be interested in getting out of, out of New York and getting back West. And uh, ended up moving out here in 2015. Um, when I joined the company, our stock was $8 a share. And I knew it had a long way to go. And that's why I wanted to join. I saw it as a real opportunity. We ended up selling to another company 18 months later for $24 a share, 3, oh, 3x. that's pretty good. Yeah. So that was great. Um, at that point, I didn't have a job because we got acquired by a bigger company. But um, I had bought a property when I was in New York, a 10-unit building in my home near my hometown of Idaho. And just kind of going back to what we were talking about before, Eve, um, how much I didn't like software stocks and equities, public equities. I really liked for about a year and a half that I had had at this little 10 unit building on the side. I don't know. There was just something about, you know, the, the, it was physical that I could see it, that we, you know, could improve the operations. We could enhance what the property looked like from the street, all those little things. And then we would see big improvements in our revenue. And I really loved that experience. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of just doing it for investment. I didn't expect that I would go into that, you know, now looking back, but I, I could clearly see that I like that a lot better. And, you know, I think you have to enjoy what you do. And so that was one thing that I, it was pretty clear to me. I, I wanted to uh, do more of that and less of public equities. So then tell us about neighborhood ventures, because that's what grew out of that love, right? <laughs> yeah. So I had actually followed you and some other folks in the industry um, in the mid 2000, 20, you know, 2014, 2015, 2016, my company got the LifeLock got bought out in 2017 and a lot was happening in the crowdfunding space. And I wanted to figure out how could I uh, raise more capital to do more projects. I had done this one project of my own on the side. And I really saw crowdfunding as a unique way to do that. Um, I didn't want to do the old fashioned country club route where you go out and oh, get yeah. a few wealthy people to raise, to write checks. That, that didn't seem very interesting to me. And I wanted to do something new and different and creative and, and kind of a new challenge. And I was looking at a building to potentially buy and, and try to crowdfund. And my broker I told him what I was looking to do. And my broker said, well, you know, I my boss talks about real estate crowdfunding all the time. And I said, well, what's his name? He said, John Kabrowski. And I ended up emailing him. And he had been a, an apartment veteran for 30 years in Phoenix and was very interested in launching a real estate crowdfunding company as well. And he brought a lot of uh, industry knowledge, you know, over 30 years in the Phoenix market it was kind of a, an instant match where I said, well, let me focus on the capital raising, the crowdfunding, the technology side, and you could really focus on the real estate side. So we realized that we had a good um, match. 
we're, we're very different in the skills that we bring and what we like to do, but that's when we launched the company and, um, the name neighborhood ventures, he had already bought and already had the domain name. And so we, I love the name and, uh, we launched in basically 2018 was our first offering. So let, let's talk about that a little bit. Like, what are you trying to accomplish with neighborhood ventures? What is it? What does it look like? What's the business? Yeah, I was talking about this yesterday in a team meeting with our team at work and um, at Neighborhood Ventures. And I think it's important to go to your why, why you do what you do, your motivation. I think that's very, um, you know, it's important to me to understand why am I doing what am I what I'm doing. And, you know, I, I also look at that in other people. Um, you know, if somebody is being very friendly to me because they're trying to sell me a, a pair of shoes at the mall. I kind of question that. I'm like, well, they're just being, you know, they're, they're just buttering me up so they can sell me something. So I think motivation matters a lot, you know, and I don't like it when, it, you know, in that situation, I, I can see real quick, okay, they're just trying, they have an angle here, right? So with Neighborhood Ventures, our, it's very simple. With John and I, we want to get more people involved in the opportunity to invest in, real, in commercial real estate. That is, has been our mission from day one. Um, it's always been a, a really good asset to own. That's what drew me to it. Um, it's very stable relative to other assets. It goes up in value. It produces cash flow. There's all these things about it that are really appealing, but it's only been available to a small group of people. So what our mission is and our, our reason why we started this is we want to get a lot more people involved in and we have big ambitions. We think we can grow that to a, a lot of folks na nationally. There's a, a big pool, you know, about 40 million people nationally who um, have funds they want to invest, but they don't reach uh, that accredited status, which most people have to reach to invest in most projects, non So that's 97% of the population, right? Approximately, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you know, young folks right now who want to start putting money away. I think commercial real estate is very appealing if they can invest in smaller increments mm -hmm. for us, it's a thousand dollar minimum. And then they can start putting, you know, even a hundred dollar increments after that or whatever it might be. Um, but they can start with small amounts and start to build that nest egg. Uh, and then we do have larger investors who like to do more than that too. But uh, our goal is to broaden that group to to allow uh, a lot of people to uh, own this this asset and and I think we're in the second inning so far and we 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 think the next few years are going to be really interesting for us. So the buildings you focus on, what are they like? John's an expert in multifamily, so we've largely focused on multifamily projects in the Arizona market, both in Phoenix and then Flagstaff. Which, if you're not from Arizona, Flagstaff is about two hours north of Phoenix. Mm -hmm. And when it's 110 in Phoenix, it's 90 or 85 oh. in Flagstaff. Balmy, right? <laughs> <laughs> and it's two hours away. So it's pretty amazing. The elevation is pretty, mm -hmm. uh, is, is a big um, factor in that. But if you're in Phoenix and you can get up to Flagstaff, it's a, it's an amazing place. It's, it's kind of almost like a, uh, you know, a Jackson Hole or an Aspen or a Park City, one of one of these cities. It's a mountain town, but it's it's great for Phoenix. So we have two projects in Flagstaff. It's an area that's landlocked, so there's not much development going to happen there. And if you can get a piece of property, it's it's a, a, a good property to hold on to. Um, and uh, so we we largely focus on finding properties that are in these core areas that have good trends happening there. Uh, but they need to be repositioned. The assets are underperforming for some reason. A lot of times it's because the amenities aren't up to date. Uh, there's been deferred maintenance. There's poor property management. And we can look at the other properties in the neighborhood and see that the rents are much higher in those properties than in this property. And that's when we act. We say, look, we, we know we can go purchase that property. So really value add. Yep. And that's smart because you can probably offer a return much earlier um, because the building continues to cash flow or starts to cash flow pretty quickly, right? 
That's right. Yeah. We, we typically don't pay distributions for the first year. Um, but it cash flows earlier. And sometimes it's been four or five months. We're paying distributions to investors. That's pretty amazing. So, you know, you actually did an offering. It was a three-way offering and one part of it was on my funding portal, small change. And that was a pretty big repositioning, um, of an, rather worn out looking hotel yeah do you want to talk about how that went yeah we still we own the asset it's performing well um this was a as i think the way you put it worn out uh hotel in a neighborhood in in mesa which is you know bedroom community to, to phoenix uh originally a very good property well built beautiful pool courtyard all of the units were sweet so they all had kitchens but the manager who had owned it for 10 years really ran it into the ground and there was a legal activity going on at the property the, the mesa police were um and the fire department were locked out of the property the owner was very antagonistic to them for wow. a mm. lot of interesting reasons and it was the blight of the neighborhood. How many units was it? It was pretty big. 120. Right, right. 120. So it's a big blight. And and here it sits in a really an up and coming area neighborhood, but it was pulling the neighborhood back. You know, there had been a Starbucks that popped up uh, 100 yards from the property. There's uh, a Costco a quarter of a mile away. It was on the up and coming, but this place just continued to drag it down. And, and it was the place that, uh, you know, bad people came to do bad things, frankly. And um, uh, and I'm sure there was other people there that were just looking for a cheap place and that's where they stayed. So mm -hmm. when we when we saw it, we saw the potential and ultimately we are planning to get it rezoned to multifamily. We're, we've been working with the city of Mesa on that and that does take some time. But until then, we operate it as a, as a vacation rental and it's doing re very well. Um, and um, and ultimately, I gather you you made improvements to it, right? Yeah, that's right. So we went in and uh, uh, new carpet, new flooring, new fixtures, new cabinetry, new paint. And you know what? It, it, this didn't take a lot. It wasn't a gut. It was kind of a they they, they call it lipstick and eyeshadow. You know, it, the the bones were good, right? So we just went in and and made it look good. Made it look like it's a place that you'd want to stay. Freshen it up. Make it contemporary and people love staying there and we do want to add it as a multifamily as an apartment building because there's a shortage of affordable housing across the board and and definitely in phoenix and these these units i think the city will uh will be able to get this rezoned and and folks will you know for example a normal two-bedroom one bath in phoenix is about 1800 and i, I think ours is going to be more like 1500 um so so to be able to add 120 yeah units onto that will will help how many buildings have you raised funds for now through neighborhood ventures we've done 13 projects uh so far 12 of them have been multifamily, and then we did do one retail project we brought on a retail expert and uh, that's a project in uh, tempe that's uh, three buildings one's a uh a uh, fast food restaurant, um, one's a Dunkin' Donuts, which we're in the process of building out right now. And then we have a third vacant that we're going to start leasing up soon. Once the Dunkin' Donuts comes in and their sign goes up, then we're going to lease that out. So that's been a really fun reposition, very similar. Similar idea. This was uh, before a uh, cannabis shop, uh, kind of a rundown mattress shop. And you know, not a place that, uh, not, not well-maintained. There hadn't been a capital investment. The parking was weird. The, the dumpster was all right in the middle of the property, that kind of thing. So <laughs> now you have your retail legs, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that, you know, the city was very excited. We were going to come in and, and help revamp that part of town. Um, but we, we believe you need to have deep, uh, expertise in whatever you're doing. So we took that on once we brought on a retail expert, mm -hmm. uh, Chris, um, uh, I, my, my mind's blanking his last name, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> okay. he, he'll forgive um, you. <laughs> yeah, maybe we'll see. Um, he's a retail expert, so he's led that for us and, uh, it's been a great project. 
Great. So your current project, full disclosure, is also raising funds on small change, which we're delighted about. And do you want to tell us about that? Where, where is it? What is it? Yeah, so this is in, uh, again, one of these up and coming areas. This one is in central Phoenix. Um, it's near my home where I live in central Phoenix. I live right off the light rail and, and love this area. But this area has seen a lot of revitalization in the last uh, decade. Um, you know, downtown kind of used to be a place in Phoenix where you didn't want to go. And this is uptown, which means it's about two, two and a half miles north of downtown. It's a highly desirable area because you're in the middle of everything. You don't have to commute mm -hmm. to work if you're <laughs> working downtown. We've seen more of the young folks who are moving to the area want to live in these areas that mm -hmm. have a bit more culture. They have more activities. They don't want, they're not going out to the, the, the suburbs. And so that's really exciting. And so this area, this project fits right into that. It's uh, 30 units. Um, and as we went and did the tour, it was very clear that they haven't done anything on this property for probably 25 years, <laughs> except the minimum yeah. amount. Yeah. But it's sitting right here around all of these uh, new build projects mm -hmm. that are, you know, six, seven stories. And uh, they're great two bedroom, one bath uh, townhouses and um, uh, stacked apartments. And um, so we saw the opportunity immediately to uh, go in and, and bring this up to the standard of today's renter. And, and we'll see a really good return on that. Once, once and so, what are you it. what's what are your plans for the project? I think it's actually six little buildings, right? It's uh, six separate buildings. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that you don't know when you do value add, sometimes you dig in there and you open a wall, so to speak, and uh, you realize you're going to have to do more plumbing. You're going to have mm -hmm. to do some electrical work. You know, the part of the flooring needs to be repaired. You know, those are the sorts of things you don't know going in. So we always build a contingency around that. But the plan here is, you know, the units were laid out really nicely. So we don't have, we're not, you know, we don't have to get permits to build anything different or to move walls. We, we avoid moving walls, but we're going to go in and, and update it. Um, new flooring, new paint, new fixtures, new cabinetry. Um, we're going to rethink the outside area. The outside area is kind of weird, kind of felt like a, you know, prison yard for whatever mm -hmm. reason, the, it's all blocked off and the pool has a, a really weird big fence around it that you can't see. So that's actually going to be one of the big value adds is kind of rethinking how the outside space is used, which is really important in Arizona, especially in the winter when people just want to spend time outside. So mm -hmm. uh, rethinking the outside, updating the inside and then the location um, because of where it's at. People will glad will be re really excited to live in that area in a in a brand new newly renovated unit. So then, what's the total development cost, including the building, and tell us about how how you're financing it. Yeah, so it's thirty units. Um, it the purchase price is two twenty two per unit, and so I, I like to look at it on a per unit basis. But two twenty two per unit is what we're buying it at, and then we're going to end up spending about thirty five thousand to renovate it. So our cost basis is you know, 260, 265,000. And, and some of that includes contingency. So if we can shave some of that off, it might be closer to mm -hmm. 260 on the high side, 265. That's your, our cost basis. And then when we look at what the value of that building is going to be, it will depend on what the rents are going to be. And mm -hmm. we're expecting the rents will be around uh, the average of that neighborhood, which is about 1800 for two bed, two bath, two bed, one bath. And, uh, you know, that would put the value of that unit around three, 325 to uh, 340. Okay. What are the rents now for that unit? <laughs> um, they're, they're in rough shape. So they're renting for under a thousand. So it's a pretty big shift. Yeah. It's a big jump. They're all over the place. There's one that's 1100 and there's one that's 800, you know, which is kind of strange that, uh, the, and they're the exact same unit. Uh, but the the neighborhood uh, comps are uh, Rio right now are 18, right. 18 to nineteen hundred. That sounds like a great project. So, so yeah. just generally, what 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 are some of the challenges that you've been confronted with with this business? Because it's different. I mean, the product is pretty normal, but the way you're tackling it is different. Yeah. Yeah, I think one of the 
our goals is to make it a frictionless experience for our investors. But we know how difficult this is uh, to get from purchasing a property, getting securing debt and capital to buy it, do the renovations, all of those steps, perform the renovations, which we have a crew in house that does all our renovations, which helps us a lot. Then leasing up the property to qualified tenants who are going to pay the rent. That's a big process in and of itself. And then continuing to collect the rent um, and, and manage that. Um, and for our investors, we want it to, to feel uh, like they're involved, that they get to see what's happening, but they don't have to worry about all of that stress. For them, it's, it's easy. It's almost like you know when you're on Amazon and you just three clicks, you get some, you order something and it shows up at your doorstep a few hours later. That type of experience is what we really aim for our investors, even though there's a lot of complications to get there. So I think the the biggest thing that is a challenge is ensuring that you don't go over budget in the renovation. It's really easy to do. That's for sure. When you get into one, a project, you say, oh, let's do that. Let's do that. And let's do that. And then you kind of realize, look, you have to have an ROI at the end of this. So you can't do everything you want to do. You have to be strategic about that and you have to uh, hit deadlines. You know, if, if one thing gets pushed back, then it pushes everything back. Um, so that's the biggest challenge. And that must have been super big the last couple of years because the construction industry got really weird there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Prices went up. It was harder to get materials. So we were, we tried to be ahead of that. We tried to order stuff well in advance. So that helped us. Um, still there were some things that we just couldn't get for a long time. Right. Um, but we think about that. We try to uh, get ahead of the game, you know, and then the other big challenge is uh, finding good deals. And we are mm -hmm. uh, very picky about the deals that we do because uh, we don't have to do deals, you know, uh, meaning uh, we're, we're going to only do deals that we really believe we can achieve. And we have a high level of confidence. Some of the ones mm -hmm. on the, on the fence we'll look at and we'll pass on. Other people might move on it because they need to deploy capital or they need to keep their investors happy or whatever. For us, we're not going to do deal unless we really have a high level of confidence. We believe in it. And that means we pass on a lot of deals. We mm -hmm. see a lot of them and we just say, look, we'll let somebody else take that. We're going to go after something that we think has a better opportunity, uh, which, uh, you know, we want to keep the risk as low as we can. Um, so, Finding deals is hard in this market. And uh, my co-founder, John, um, he runs day to day. He's the CEO of ABI Multifamily. They're the largest broker in Arizona that sells apartments. They sold 125 apartments so far this year. And that's where we get our, our deal flow. A lot of times old clients call him and say, hey, look at this. Uh, here's a project that I'm looking at selling and we buy it off market. Um, so figuring out where those deals are going to come from, especially in a market where it's tight mm -hmm. has been really important for us. And we have a big advantage there, but it can be really challenging to find those deals yeah. and, um, and the, the really have a, a good amount of juice left in them. So are you thinking about expanding operations beyond Flagstaff and Phoenix and maybe even beyond Arizona? Uh, yeah, yeah. So working with small change is kind of our first step into that, where we can now raise capital from investors nationally. Prior to that, we've only raised capital from Arizona investors to the Arizona crowdfunding laws. So we're excited to begin to raise capital and to begin building invest our investor base nationally. And uh, over the next uh, 18 months, I think they'll be actually sooner than that, probably six months. I think we'll have some exciting announcements, more things we're doing nationally to meet our mission. We want to, you know, we have about 5,000 investors in Arizona so far, and we're just in Arizona. So we want to go nationally and uh, offer what we are doing to, you know, the whole country. And we're really excited about that. And um, so I think it's going to be an exciting time for us. We've been building towards this. So our momentum just kind of keeps carrying us through to this next step. Well, thank you very much for joining me. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing the next exciting announcements. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Jameson. We're excited. Thanks again for having us. We love uh, 
everything small change is doing and uh, love to partner with you guys and and um you guys are great to work with so thanks for having us on appreciate today. that i appreciate that that was jameson manwaring ceo of neighborhood ventures Jameson is putting his determination to work building his innovative company in Arizona. It's a real estate company for sure. They buy, hold and sell property. But the capital plan is innovative, with a growing pool of Arizona residents permitted to invest through Arizona Interstate Securities Law. He's seen early success and he's taken his plan to the national stage, raising funds for a second time now on my crowdfunding platform, smallchange.co. We can't wait to see how it turns out. I hope you enjoyed today's guest in our deep dive. You can find out more about this episode or others you might have missed on the show notes page at rethinkrealestateforgood.co. There's lots to listen to there. You can support this podcast by sharing it with others, posting about it on social media, or leaving a rating and review. To catch all the latest from me, you can follow me on LinkedIn. Even better, if you're ready to dabble in some impact investing yourself, head on over to wefunder.com forward slash small change, where you can invest directly in small change and our mission to democratize capital formation to create impact in commercial real estate development. A special thanks to David Allardyce for his excellent editing of this podcast and original music. And a big thanks to you for spending your time with me today. We'll talk again soon, but for now, this is Eve Picker signing off to go make some change. Um.